right guys, this is the one I'm going to show you here. This is called Kazanlik. Uh, Kazanlik is named after the region in Bulgaria where they actually harvest the roses for perfume. I thought that was a fitting way to start the tour, is this is the one that started it all in terms of the rose being such a popular shrub for perfume, for edible purposes, culinary purposes. Now, if you grab one of these, and I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab the nicest there is right now, uh, something that is fresh, and if you stuck it to your nose, probably catch a really nice perfume. Here's the problem with uh, this situation is it's windy and it's not first thing in the morning and so it might not be as impressive as you like. You gotta remember these are volatile oils that come from the perfume. So if you were doing the harvest in Bulgaria what you would do is then you would uh, you would go to them very first thing in the morning preferably not on a windy day when the dew is still upon it and take them off just as they are the freshest of blooms uh, just the the earliest and you fill a big sack of them and you get them to this distillery uh, long before the perfume has had a chance uh, to uh, dissipate into the atmosphere. You can see it's quite a large shrub and you can imagine the rose fields of Bulgaria filled with these, you know, eight foot shrubs that people are just picking the roses off and slinging these big bags of, of roses. So feel free as you walk past this one to grab yourself a rose if you'd like and have a sniff, but it is actually quite nice. The next rose I'm going to introduce you to here is called Henri Martin. And this is also called red moss. And this is a centifolia rose that's made into a moss. So it's sort of got parentage of all of the different old roses. But the reason I want to show it to you, first of all, later on you can see that they move towards larger uh, flowers with more petals. And this was what they were aiming for in the ideal of being a red rose. Now, most people are going to look at this and say, that's not red at all. That's rather a deep pink. And th that's what passed for red at the time before they added a whole bunch of the new color ranges into the breeding of roses. I'm going to take a sniff of this here. You're going to have to get up close and personal to find out why this is called a moss rose because if you look at these buds they are covered with a resinous kind of mossy material that if you rub your fingers on it actually has a scent all of its own, kind of a camphory or resinous smell. Um, this went into fashion, the idea of moss roses. It was a mutation on the Centifolia roses, and it went into fashion uh, for, say, 50 years, and they were breeding everything with moss on it, and then it fell out of fashion. So there's a handful of these that I'm going to be able to show you in the garden, but do feel free to have a look at this. Quite a nice bloom, but, uh, but the moss is the star of the show on this, and you don't see it on every rose. Moving not too far away here, I'm going to try to keep them in a pattern here so we don't have to do a ton of walking. This is called a Variegata di Bologna. And this is, I mean, this splashy, splashy, I mean, again, later breeding, this is a Bourbon Rose. And Bourbon Roses are sort of that first generation crosses between the old European Roses and the Chinese Roses. Uh, so they picked up some of the colors and charm and, and full bloom of the European roses, but also get a scattered bloom later on in the season. So this is not the last time this will bloom, but you can see it is the largest flush of blooms it's going to have. Just tons here, and it's going to arch downwards and just be covered in these blooms. So I'm going to grab this Variegata de Bologna, and lots of petals. I'm not getting a lot of scent off of it here, but that could just be the day. Okay, this beautiful yellow rose here, uh, I have it in my collection as Rosa Fetida or Persian Yellow. I admit I'm not 100% sure that's how it came to me in the trade. It actually may be one called Harrison's Yellow, which is the Yellow Rose of Texas. You may have heard the name, but big flush of blooms. Uh, it is one of the earliest. It's actually closely related to the Scots Roses, which that's an example right there, William III. The Scots Roses are the very first thing to bloom in the season, and this is why a tour like this is actually quite difficult to time because uh, if you'd come here two weeks ago, right near the front gate where you came in, Prairie Peace would have been the most impressive thing you've ever seen. Today, scattered of the late blooms, this here is going to look very impressive right now, but again, two weeks from now, it won't look so great. Uh, Persian yellow, or Rosa Fetida, that uh, this is in the collection as, is the source of saturated yellows, oranges, and a big contributor to the hot reds that come into modern roses. So it's an important rose in terms of its place in rose breeding, uh, but also quite worth having in the garden. Now, Rosa Fetida actually means stinking rose. <laughs> so if anybody wants to give a sniff of this, I'm not sure you'll get anything pleasant. <laughs> Okay, 
This one here is called Madame Plantier, and you're going to have to get a close-up look at the bloom here. Uh, beautiful white with some beige tones in the center, maybe some light bit of pink. Uh, it has a green eye, uh, just a wonderful rose, uh, very thin, wispy stems. You can see it kind of wants to spill over its container here and make a large shrub. Uh, fantastic fragrance on this. Uh, kind of a classic kind of soapy rose fragrance and I'm going to show you a little bit later on I'm going to take this with me maybe stick it in my pocket instead so I know where to find it uh, but it is identical to a completely unrelated rose Madame Hardy that I'll be showing you in a couple minutes here but uh, I love the habit of this and nearly completely thornless my favorite hybrid perpetual Ooh. roses still an old rose but a repeat bloomer and it has these beautiful white edges on the outside of the bloom so uh, deep red or, or purple with the white edges the most photogenic rose in my garden however it is not the easiest thing to grow so uh, you know to have it in your collection you have to put up with a little bit of black spot a little bit of foliar disease it isn't the easiest thing to keep clean uh, but it is that case in point of why sometimes the difficult roses are still worth having Favorite? Uh, yeah, whichever one I'm standing at. <laughs> I wanted to get you a quick look at this one, Belle de Cressy. And uh, Belle de Cressy is kind of characteristic in, in this example of sort of the low suckering habit of Gallicas. Gallicas don't stand up high, they kind of flop over and have lots of little suckers coming up from the base, making us a l very low bramble. Uh, what is kind of unique about this one, Belle de Cressy, is this color. I mean, this mauve, sort of a washed out mauve with a little bit of tone of, of uh, pink and, and red in it, uh, is just a gorgeous color. Uh, the parentage of it is somewhat disputed, but we know Gallica is in there. It may have a China ancestor as well, but it is not repeat blooming, which is case in point, I'll show you in Cardinal Richelieu a little bit as well, is that even if it has a repeat blooming ancestor and a once blooming ancestor, usually it ends up being a little bit more like the once bloomers and not blooming again in the garden. Okay, you asked for my favorite. This is kind of my favorite in a way. I mean, I just think it's distinct as far as roses go. I mean, look at the overall form of this thing. It is just a completely rounded shrub with the roses held tight into the into the uh, into the shrub itself, into the foliage. And as far as I can tell, and it's just an, a personal nose thing, is I think this has the nicest scent when it's fresh. It has kind of a nice blend of the Damask uh, fragrance and the Gallica fragrance. It is, a, it is a combination of both, and it is a repeat bloomer. So this is a uh, Damask Perpetual or a Portland Rose is what it is. This one here is Rose de Resht, named after, I think, a city in Iran or Persia. Again, down to that low suckering habit. Look at this. It's just a, a nice uh, low shrub. And uh, I'm going to pick one off of here. But yeah, that cup shape. Doesn't that remind you of something like uh, the modern Earth Angel, which is a reproduction of this kind of rose? Again, with the green center or button in the center there. Excellent fragrance. This is a hybrid china, but not repeat blooming. And I, I can't walk by it really without saying hello to Jacques Cartier, which is another Portland rose. So that's like Rose de Rest back there. And again, you can see it in the habit with just how low and cluster flowering it is, how it keeps its blooms really tight to the foliage. And sometimes the blooms look super tidy. Today, they look a little unkempt. That's okay. Lots, lots more to come. This rose, which is another star of the show, is called Belle Amour. And this is an Elba rose, in fact, but that bloom color is fantastic, that form and the fragrance of the Elbas is very distinctive compared to the rest of them. And since we're just like kitty corner here, this is a brand new rose in my garden, so it's tiny. This is not the habit of it, this is actually going to be a fairly large shrub, 
but this is called, uh, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, but it's a Gros Chou de Hollande, which is uh, a large cabbage or cabbage rose. Um, and if you look at that, you can see why they sort of call it that. The form has just a ton of petals packed in there. And uh, this is the second most used rose in the world for fragrance, for perfume. So the first one we stopped by, Kazanlik, that's the number one. Uh, this is the one that's used in Morocco and France, uh, the Provence rose, it's also called. You didn't, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no S on the end of the first part. Gros chou. Gros chou. There we go. <laughs> you up for some other friends. <laughs> so look at the buds on this one and this is uh, Napoleon's hat or chapeau de Napoleon and this is a variation of a moss rose. So the moss roses that I showed you that Henri Martin first, um, this one here has the uh, sort of trifoliate hat of Napoleon on each of the blooms and uh, I'll let you have a look at that there Lisa at the back of that thing you can see it has just a really ornate kind of mossy covering on the outsides of the buds um, one of my favorites and not in full bloom right now but really the blooms I'm not going to call them nothing special but they're a bit like a, a, a centifolia rose or uh, the gros shoe as we said um, so this one is quite like that but it has the ornate Kind of covering on the outside. How can I walk past Paul Neron with such a big bloom as this and not take that off? And Paul Neron is a hybrid perpetual rose and it's well known for having just super super large blooms like this, uh, almost like a peony or something like that. Uh, very upright. It was uh, one of the the hybrid perpetuals sort of, were sort of made for exhibition. They were made to be uh, exhibitors blooms. So that's what this one was built for. What's that? Well, oh, that's a red horse chestnut tree. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I figure that's a nice, a nice centerpiece for the rose garden, uh, just because it's such a, a tidy-looking tree. Uh, it blooms right now with the early roses. It's a, it's a bit early for most, for the main flush of roses. Okay, I wanted to show you this guy here. Is called Cardinal Richelieu, and Cardinal Richelieu has. It's a bit, it reminds me a little bit of Belle de Cressy, and it's breeding a similar, it's a Gallica rose with some china in there, and just that sort of glowing purple uh, in the center. You don't find that tone so much in the modern rose. It's about the closest you maybe find to something like Ebb Tide or something like that, but that really is an astounding uh, color and outstanding fragrance as well. The Mills is uh, slowly going to take over this entire garden if I leave it here. And so sometime in the next few weeks, I'm going to pull out the tractor, I'm going to dig the whole thing up, uh, take a chunk of it, put it on the edge of the property where all the poorly behaved roses live, <laughs> and uh, then I'm going to try to eliminate it from this garden bed. Um, excuse me for one minute while I grab a snipping from another rose. Hold on to that for a second. I will be right back, I promise. I'll just show you this one. And now I'll take this one back from here. Okay. So this one here is from a completely different rose, a modern rose called William Shakespeare 2000. That's a David Austin reproduction of old garden roses. So you can see that one thing that's nice about this is it's bigger, it's repeat blooming, it doesn't just bloom once in the year, and it doesn't sucker or attack your garden, right? So to that degree, I think this is charming. Uh, this is maybe a better choice overall if you're looking for something that will behave well in your garden. So unless you have a penalty box like I do on the outside of your property, I'm not sure what that might not be for you. Yeah, I can never get them. What is that? That's an allium. Oh, oh wow, that's super cool. When I bought my new Okay, I want to show you one other one here. This is Madame Hardy. And I think I stuck a rose in my pocket at some point here from Madame Plantier. And you can see, Madame Plantier and Madame Hardy are basically the same rose. This one is a damask rose, that one is an alba rose. They're 
relatively unrelated, but they look exactly the same, except this one has the larger blooms, that one has the smaller blooms. Uh, this is the one that uh, Peter Beals considered to be the most perfect rose ever grown. He's, that's the, this is the, the pinnacle because of just, it's sort of because it has those other tones in there, whiter than white in a way, with the green center. It's just a, a really outstanding rose and lots of fragrance on that. And Chloris is another Elba rose, and uh, this one is also thornless. Uh, light pink, great fragrance on that, and uh, I just, I love the overall habit of it, and it does display for me a little bit more of that sort of bluish or grayish coloring to the foliage that the Elbas are known for. Well, it feels like I maybe have led you to the absolute windiest spot of the garden. Uh, and as I mentioned, what I try to do is if something is too large for the tires over there, like the habit is just too big, what I will often do is replace it out to the outside of the property here. Uh, this one here, just as a special treat, is the Eglantine Rose. It, kind of, it shows up in Shakespearean poetry and that kind of thing. Um, but one interesting, it's a very simple, looks like a dog rose, it's a very simple bloom, uh, but uh, just a bit of trivia around the foliage, it smells of baked apples, especially when it's wet. So you will oftentimes, if it's raining, I'll walk out here and be like, oh, what is, oh, yeah, it's, a, it's like an apple pie, but if you crush and sniff, you can get the same thing. And I invite you to do so if you'd like, but it's kind of a neat rose and, uh, and actually has really nice looking hips after the bloom period. Yeah, isn't that cool? Okay, I'm going to show you this one here. This is what I'm going to call. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to fudge things a little bit and call this the White Rose of York. Now we don't know literally what was the historical White Rose of York, but we know it was a White Rose. We know it's in the Elba class, and this one typifies about the best that grayish or silvery color of the foliage. It's a little bit different than the other roses you would have seen, but that color of the bloom. Uh, there's another rose, the red rose of Lancaster, that was the Gallica rose. It's not quite in bloom, we'll walk past it in just a minute, but the two of those are known for being the floral emblems of the War of the Roses, and then later they combined them together to make, I think, the Tudor rose, uh, which was red because the Gallica uh, bloom is larger with white in the center. Well, by this point, you're probably really sick of seeing me uh, pick up another purple or pink bloom with tons and tons of petals on them. Uh, you want to see something a little different. This is a little different, isn't it? This is uh, La Belle Sultane, and it is a Gallica rose with these wide open blooms, but just a glimmering purple mottled uh, color to it. So very distinct and unique. I moved this one. Uh, a couple or three years ago, and it has not responded well to it. Uh, a lot of them will bounce back very, very quickly. I'm hoping that this one will be a much more commanding shrub in two years, so I have a look out for that, but what a neat looking rose. So this is a, just in passing, because it's a small shrub right now, this is another Alba rose called Great Maiden's Blush, or Quise de Nymph, um, which I guess means the eyes of a nymph or something like that. Quise um, de Nymph, there you go. Um, so this is quite a nice rose, it was uh, present, we know for sure, in uh, Empress Josephine's garden. Uh, so old romantic, and uh, again, one of the best known of the old garden roses, and it's quite nice. Um, this one here, I, you know, I, I don't mind that the timing was off for some of the roses. This one here, I really wish I could have shown you some more blooms on. It's called the Painted Damask. And I'm going to see if I can find one that typifies this. But you can see here, I'm going to give you a sort of a close-up look here. It's got sort of raspberry ripple fringes on each of the blooms here. I'm going to get another one here, because as it gets more fully open, then what you see is it's kind of white in the center with the pink edges. Uh, another one that's similar is called Hebe's Lip, but this is called Lida.
you're just at the front entrance of the garden, I have one more, Robert Le Dieb, uh, Robert the Devil, named after an opera. Quite a quite an old rose, Centifolia, and again, just has. Uh, I think I've probably shown you probably three or four that I would call like deep purple roses, and this is. From, from my point of view, about the best of them. When the shrub gets covered, it just gets absolutely loaded down with these wonderful purple blooms with a great Gallic scent. Okay, this one here is Commandant Beau Repair, and I love the striped roses. Uh, this one has, if you get, a, and you have to appreciate this one really close up, so do feel free to nose in there as you're walking by, uh, but it has beautiful, lighter reverse on the petals, uh, stripes in sort of pink and purple and white so uh, very fine and very pretty and makes a very upright shrub this one I had it before I moved it I think we had it up to about 15 feet so it can make quite a large shrub um, but lots of blooms and it is repeat blooming just I've got uh, just this one and then Stanwell Perpetual on the corner there to show you and then you're free uh, you can wander all you'd like this one here I thought would be worth mentioning because it's Rosa Moesii, a species rose, a wild rose from China that has this sort of brick red color to it and it forms what I would call a tree. I mean that's what I'm aiming to do here is just train it right up, go across that archway but really make it sturdy and those, those stems down low can become super thick over time so that's what I'm hoping to get it to do. Uh, blooms just once in the year but it's followed by very attractive sort of urn shaped hips so uh, at this point uh, I hate making excuses for it but believe it or not this is a young specimen and it wow. will be much more impressive over the years. Uh, I, don't, I don't know maybe maybe I have the new India spot in the garden. Uh, final rose I'm going to highlight here just because it's in such beautiful bloom right now this is called Stanwell Perpetual. It is a Scots rose. The Scots roses begin their bloom cycle super early in the season, but as you may know from the name, Perpetual, this one continues to re-bloom throughout the season. So unlike all the other Scots roses you would have seen here, this one continues to re-bloom. And what I kind of love about it is that although the impression of it is white, the fresh blooms here have a distinct pinkish tinge to them. So it's a, it's a very gentle coloration. Uh, wonderful fragrance on this, and uh, you know, it, uh, it again carries it tough. Like you can see, this is under shade. Uh, it'll take a shady location, it'll take a sunny location, it'll take a location on a slope, it'll take a location in poor soil. Um, so, the Scots roses are sort of all that for being an adaptable garden shrub. All right, that's this it. Might grow between my shed and the fence, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you're choosing something that had a tough location, that's probably a better choice. So I think that covers it for the ones I had on my, let's say, my agenda to cover for the video here. Uh, certainly you are very welcome to wander as long as you want, as much as you want around the garden, and uh, I will be available. And uh, also, if there was something that you saw in the greenhouses that you were interested in buying, uh, we have a full greenhouse full of roses at the back there, uh, then uh, we'd be happy to bring those through as well. And, uh, and there's complimentary coffee and tea and cookies on the picnic table there. And I'll get some cold drinks too because I wasn't expecting the sun to come out. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, guys.